a privilege. As we begin looking at your love, the wonders of your love, Lord, I pray that we would have soft hearts to let you speak from your word. And what you have said is true about you, about your love, Lord, I pray that it would resonate in our hearts, that it would impact our souls, Lord, that it would increase our faith, that it would bolster our confidence, that it would make us more like Christ as we submit ourselves to you with a hope that cannot be touched. Lord, your love is truly amazing, and Lord, we pray that as we enter into this Christmas season, Lord, the realities pertaining to you and who you are and what you have accomplished would radically influence how we navigate these things, how we celebrate. Lord, I pray that we would be awed, that we would be humbled, that we would be captivated by you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, welcome. Uh, As we begin, we're going to be spending this week and the next looking at the wonders of God's love. Christmas is one of my favorite. It is my favorite time of the year. It finally gets below 80 degrees in Arizona. Almost. I think we're, we're right on the cusp. Maybe this week it's supposed to get below 80 degrees. But the intentional reflection on our Savior, Jesus Christ, coming to earth, it is so refreshing. It is so encouraging. Without a doubt, a predominant reality, a precious truth about Christmas is that God so loved the world, and in this, in loving the world, he sent his only begotten Son, God so loved the world, that is to say, he loved the world in this manner. He loved the world like so. He sent his only begotten son. To see God's love, we must just look to the incarnation and life of Jesus our Lord. And so this week and next, we're going to explore the incomprehensible. We're going to look together at the love of God. And it would be foolish to think we could even scratch the surface of the love of God in two hour sessions, but we're going to spend some time this week looking at God's love from a few different passages. And then next week, we're going to really spend some time narrowing in, looking at the love of God expressed in the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the love of God demonstrated in Jesus coming to earth. And it's absolutely essential to look at what God's word has to say about God's love. God is the authority. Uh, So often, in fact, exclusively, the world skews biblical love. It can't get love right. It mangles what true love is. And looking to the world, we find many associate with love the reality of senselessness. Love is intoxicating. As the intensity of one's love increases, their recklessness also rises. Simply watch a cartoon's depiction of love and you'll see the world's view of love. Pepe Le Pew's relentless pursuit of love seems quite comical, but in reality, it's grossly distorted what love truly is. Reduced it to senseless passion. One who is often looked to for wisdom described it this way. You're walking along, minding your own business. You're looking neither to the left or to the right. When all of a sudden, you run smack into a pretty face. Woo-woo! You begin to get weak in the knees. Your head's in a whirl. And then you feel as light as a feather. Before you know it, you're walking on air. And then you know what? You're knocked for a loop, and you completely lose your head. While friend Owl referred to it as being Twitter-pated, his critter friends expressed how awful that sounded. What's even more tragic is when we impose this kind of view of love on God. God's love is nothing like this. God's love does not lead him to lose his wits or become senseless. 
God's love does not lead him to be careless or short-sighted or delusional. God's is not blinded by his love. His senses do not dull due to his love. His love is always deliberate. 1 John 4, 8 tells us God is love. And it is true that the love of God is an attribute of God, but it is part of his spiritual essence. Do I need to switch? Did I, did I go out or is it just I'm not as loud in my head? Keep going. Nope, that's okay. 1 John 4, 8 tells us God is love, and it is true that the love of God is an attribute of God, but it is, it is part of his spiritual essence, his being. And, and some have wanted to use this verse to say that all of God is summed up in love. This is ridiculous. Thinking God is summed up in one virtue and one attribute as if the entirety of God could be summed up in love. That's not the point. It's actually the opposite. If you want to truly understand love, you look to God. Not because God is constrained or restrained or exclusively summed up in love, but because if you want to get the entirety of what true love is, look no further than to God himself. Everything you need to know about love is found, can be found, in God. And so we look to God to understand love. We look to God and we bask in the richness of his love, which expresses itself and evidences itself in many other elements of God such as his goodness and his mercy and his kindness and his grace, they all find their origin in God's love. The love of God is truly wondrous. It is truly amazing. It must captivate our attention. So, as we discuss the love of God uh, further, it's important to define what we mean by the love of God. To sum it up in a phrase, which seems kind of silly to try to encapsulate the love of God in a phrase, but if we were attempted to, to do so, I've attempted to do so, you could say it this way. The love of God is this. God gives of himself to others for their good by his own choice, regardless of their merit or response. I'll say it again. God gives of himself to others for their good by his own choice, regardless of their merit or response. What we're going to do is we're going to look at four elements of this self-giving love of God that he extends for others' good by his own choice without merit or response. We're going to look at four elements of God's wondrous love. And the first element that we're going to look at this morning of God's wondrous love is this. God's wondrous love is unprompted. And that is, it's unprompted by something outside of himself. God's love, God's wondrous love is unprompted. It is an undeserved love. It is an everlasting love. It doesn't originate out of what others are or what others can do for God. He has loved from everlasting. God's love originates. It is compelled. It is prompted only out of himself. This is a free love, an unprovoked love. It's spontaneous in that it originates out of God himself. It's not solicited by something outside of him that then merits it or calls for it. There's not something outside of God that draws his attention to that object for which he will show love. It originates out of him by his own sovereign will. Turn to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. God's love is unprompted. He shows love to whom he chooses. He shows love to whom he wills. In verse 6, it reads, For you are a holy people. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting in verse 6. For you are a holy people that is, they're set apart to the Lord your God. God. 
The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all of the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And then look at verse 7. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. See, God's love is not a testimony to the value of the object of his love, but a testimony to the purity, to the holiness, the nature of his love. There was nothing in Israel that prompted God's love for them. It's not that they were greater than other nations. It's not that they were more in number than other nations. And so, okay, I'm, I'm going to pick who I'm going to set my love on. These people will give me what I want in return. Look at what they're capable of. That's not how God thinks. That's not how God expresses love. That's not to whom God extends love based off of others' merit. He, he doesn't love Israel because they were more in number. I love how God's put this forth in verse 7. I, I didn't love you because you were more in number, as if you were a greater nation. You had the fewest number. I might ruin a, a favorite Christmas hymn for some, but the line in O Holy Night that says, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth, as if the appearing of our Savior is a testimony to the value of mankind. God looked at mankind, saw how worthy they were of such a love, and so he condescended and sent his son. That's a horrible view of love. That's a false view of love. God didn't send his son. He didn't extend love to the world because we merited it. All that God would see if he were to look at the souls of mankind is wicked, rebellious, depraved, vile, selfish sinners. He didn't save you, Christian, because your soul was more valuable than others. If you were to ponder verse 7, you, you, you would liken it to this. I didn't save you because your soul was more valuable than others. I saved you because you were the least valuable. I don't know if you ever played sports with groups of friends as a kid, but everybody would line up and you'd pick captains, right? You'd have two captains, typically the two best players, and then they'd get to choose who they wanted on their team and who would always get picked first. The best players, right? The, the players of greatest value to the team. And I always wondered what that'd be like, but as I waited and oftentimes got picked last... I knew why. God doesn't pick teams this way. He doesn't evaluate which, which will give the greatest aid to what I'm trying to accomplish. God doesn't need us that way. His love is unprompted. He's not evaluating, evaluating what he can gain. John MacArthur tells a story that he had an opportunity to read the will of Jeffrey Dahmer. Do you remember Jeffrey Dahmer? He was the mask-murdering homosexual who killed 17 and cannibalized a, a number of them. He died at the hands of some fellow prisoners. And it's reported that he had made a confession of faith in Jesus and had been baptized prior to his death. 
MacArthur says in Dahmer's will that he had a chance to look at, Dahmer repeatedly expressed his genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in confidence that Christ had forgiven all his sins. And the chaplain that interacted with Dahmer said that there was no question in his mind, but that the faith of Jeffrey Dahmer was indeed placed in Jesus Christ and that he is now in Christ's presence. I don't know if Dahmer's faith was sincere, but I do know that God's love is more than enough to save the most vile. God's love is unprompted and not contingent on someone's moral excellence. And if we exclude someone from being reachable by God's love because of their own moral standing, God's love is no longer exclusively a testimony of his virtue. Because God's love is unprompted by anything outside of God himself, we can actually say to anyone that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will forgive you. He will forgive your sin. He will redeem you. Just like he forgave the sins of Paul, who said he was the chief of sinners, he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a murderer. We are indeed free to proclaim the love of God far and wide because there are no restrictions on whom God is willing to lavish love upon. No conditions that must be met in an individual before they are qualified to receive the love of God. Where people get tripped up is thinking the inevitable response to God's love is the occasion for it. Right? We get things backwards. The inevitable response of what someone does when God lavishes his love, that's the reason for it. And that's not the case. Just because there's a result of God's love doesn't mean that that result is the occasion for it. God does not love us because he knows we'll love in return, and so then it's worth it for him. When God lavishes his saving love upon someone, his love is so transformative, you love him back. That's a testimony to the intensity and, and purity and effects of his love. It's not the occasion for it. I think that's oftentimes where people can get confused. God loved me because he knew I would love him back. He knew it would be worth it. Well, of course he knew those things. The only response that one can have to a, a saving love of God in Christ is to repent, is to submit to him. And this clarifies what I said in our definition of love. God gives of himself to others for their good by his own choice, regardless of their merit or response. God's love, his giving of himself is his choice, not influenced by their merit or response, although it produces a response. God's love is not prompted by someone's response. He gives out of his own character, out of his own holiness, his own purity. Have you ever had the thought, God could never love me? You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I'm really like. You don't know what really goes on in my heart. The reality is none of us are lovable. That's not why God lavishes love on his children. The love of God shows to mankind that God's love is, is unprompted. It is pure. It originates out of himself. It is for his glory, for his purposes, and it is always undeserved, always unprompted. As I mentioned before, all we bring to the table is what is unlovable, which makes the wonders of God's love that much more impressive. Have you ever had the thought that someone you know is too far gone for God's love? They've rejected too many times. It's hopeless. You don't know how they live. You don't know the utter disdain they have for God. Oh, they just hate God. They, they shut down all conversations about God. God. 
They want nothing to do with God. Their whole life is an outward display of rebellion against God. I've got great news. That summarizes every single person before God saves them. God's love is not contingent upon where someone is at. God simply extends love out of his own virtue, his own character. How about your love for others? We are to love as we have been loved. We know love because we have experienced God's love. A primary virtue of Christians is love, love for one another, love for, the enemy, for our enemies, love for the lost. Are you willing to give of yourself for others' good without any prompting? Are you willing to give of yourself for others' good without any expectation of what you will receive in return? What you might gain from them? Have you ever sought to love somebody and been hurt in return? And then had the thought, I don't want to go through that again. Have you placed conditions, expectations, necessary prompting for your love for others? We must repent of such things. We must love as we have been loved. First, the first wonderful reality of God's love is that it is unprompted. Second, what we're going to look at this morning is that God's wondrous love is this. It's indiscriminate. He has an indiscriminate love. Turn to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. God's love is indiscriminate. Jonah is called by God, you know the story, to go to Nineveh and proclaim judgment upon them for their wickedness. And Jonah is displeased with that instruction from the Lord, and so he attempts to flee to Tarshish, and God provides some course correction for Jonah through a vigorous, intense storm. Jonah knows he's the reason why these sailors are having to navigate this storm, and so he is cast into the sea and swallowed by a great fish, and Jonah goes then to Nineveh, and proclaims judgment against them, and Nineveh repents. And then look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Nineveh repents, and here's Jonah's response. Verse 1 of chapter 4 of Jonah. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry, indignant. Jonah was displeased. It greatly displeased Jonah. He became angry and then keep reading. He prayed to Yahweh and said, please Yahweh, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. He's upset that God showed compassion. He's upset that God was gracious to these people. He goes on to say, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. I knew you were going to forgive them. You don't understand how truly wicked they are. We are your people. Israel's your people. You're not, it's not right that you would save them, that you would show mercy and compassion and love to them, loving kindness. And Jonah is so distraught, he gets away from the city. He's furious at what God is doing. And then verse 6, if you look just down a little bit farther, so the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah. God's going to teach Jonah some things here, to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. The plant is serving Jonah's purposes, but he's furious about the repentance of Nineveh and that God is relenting in his judgment against them. Then God appoints a worm, and the worm eats and kills the plant, and once again, Jonah is enraged. 
God asks Jonah again in verse 9, do you have good reason to be angry? And then we come to really the summary of the whole book of Jonah, the main point of the whole account of what God is doing. We see God's compassion is unbiased. His love is indiscriminate. Look at verse 10. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. God has continually shown grace to Jonah, but Jonah wants to put limits on the compassion of God that he shows to others. And in verse 11, we see this whole point summarized. Verse 11, it says, should I, this is God, should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals? Verse 11 is the key to understanding the entire book. God's love is not limited to one particular people or person. It's not limited to man's wisdom or man's purposes. It is in accordance with God, his virtue, his character, his plan, his purposes. God shows compassion to those whom he chooses, to those whom he wills. Jonah was upset about a plant and yet angry that God showed compassion to Nineveh. There are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand. This is most likely referring to children six and under, which puts the population of the whole city most likely around 600,000, as well as many animals. Jonah's upset about a plant being destroyed, but he wants a city with 120,000 children, six and younger, and full of animals to be destroyed. And so this book ends with God presenting a contrast between two paths. Jonah's view and God's view. Jonah's way was different from God, and he's upset because God didn't do it right from Jonah's perspective. And God says, all my ways are right, and my love reaches far beyond one people group. Jonah's sinful response to God's way is not here so that we can say, God, thank you, I'm not like Jonah. I would never question you this way. Jonah is held up as a mirror for us to understand our sinful thinking and the distinct purity of God's ways and his thinking. The book of Jonah was a mirror for Israel as Jonah was a representative of Israel, but it's a mirror for us as well. Are we trusting God's character, his choices of what is best? And this is easy when God raises up what makes sense to us. What provides immediate comfort or relief, particularly physically, as we see in Jonah's case with a, a plant for Jonah. But it's hard when something doesn't make sense to us. When something is outside of our own agenda, our own desires, our own thoughts. Jonah made an idol out of his comfort. He valued a withering plant more than the withering souls of Nineveh. God is not to be subject to our whims. He's not obligated to act out all of our desires of what we think is best or what we think is right. This is an important lesson in thinking about how we ponder our view of God. Jonah knew something true to be about God's character, about his virtue, and did not want God to have occasion to act on it because he believed he knew better. Where do we know things to be true about God and yet we are dissatisfied with the reasoning in our own mind of what God's word clearly says is true about him and we seek to change God or be dissatisfied with him in some manner? God is always working for his glory. He is executing perfectly all things for his 
uh, his glory in accordance with his will for his children's good. And never once has God's plan been delayed or deterred or adjusted. Nothing has ever caught God off guard. He is supremely powerful. He is supremely sovereign. He is only holy and righteous all the time. He's worthy of our praise and our worship and our submission, even when we don't understand, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's hard, even if, when it feels like the cost is too much, even when we feel as though we cannot bear it, we cannot reason it away by our own devices, we still must yield, obey, submit, and trust God's love is so holy. And he has the right to extend that love to whomever he wills, and he is indiscriminate with that love. He has not called for himself a certain type of person, a certain group of people. He shows compassion to whom he wills. What a glorious reality. His will is perfect. He is a God who loves to save. He is a God who is committed to his own glory. He loves his children. He is a God of compassion who cares with a deep love for those who are his and whom he will save. And how precious is this reality that God's love is indiscriminate. We don't have to suspect his motives. We don't have to be suspect of his purposes. He is supremely wise. He is the sovereign, omnipotent God, and he has the right to show compassion, to take pity, to extend love to whom he wills. These are wondrous realities of an amazing God. Number one, his love is unprompted. Number two, his love is indiscriminate. And number three, his love is inseparable. Number three, the third wondrous reality of God's love that we will look at this morning is that his love is inseparable. That, it is, it, that is, it is permanent. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8, we'll look at verse, verses 35 through 39. And I'm sure you know them well. Paul asks the question, as he's been asking several questions with obvious answers. In verse 35, who will separate us from the love of God, uh, excuse me, from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril, or sword. Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. In verse 37, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Confidence, security, hope are all present for the believer in the love of God, in the inseparable love of God. You cannot be separated from God's love. God's love is inseparable from you. There is no limit, no separation. You are secure. You are bound to God in love. It cannot be undone. It cannot be thwarted cannot be minimized or distorted. It cannot be contaminated. The question in in verse 35, who will separate? Who who will split you apart? Who Who will create some sort of gap, some sort of distance between you and God's love? The obvious answer is nothing, no one. 
can do so. What things might threaten the reality of God's love being connected to you? Well, what things, if, if there were something that we might be tempted to think could create a separation between us and God's love, what might it be? And Paul gives us a list of seven, thi- seven things. What threatens the reality of God's love for you? Tribulation. Distress. Persecution. Famine, nakedness, peril, sword, none of these. Tribulations, difficulties, trials. They can't separate you from the, God, the love of God. Distress, times of need, times of hardship. They can't separate you from the love of God. What about persecution? What if your, your life was about to be taken from you? What about mistreatment from others? That cannot separate you from the love of God. What about famine? What if you go hungry? What if your your daily needs are being threatened? That can't separate you from the love of God. What about nakedness? A lack of what protects you from the elements. Things that might create anxiety and hardship in our hearts. That can't separate you from the love of God. Peril, the sword, death itself. Nothing can separate you. God's love is permanent. It is inseparable. And then Paul says something interesting. Just as it is written, here's the demonstration as to why. And we see a psalm of lament being expressed here where he says, being put to death all day as sheep to be slaughtered. No suffering will separate you from God's love. Just as it is written, you're going to suffer like sheep to the slaughter. The assurance of God's inseparable love is not a promise that you will not endure hardship or difficulty. If you are suffering as a child of God, it is not that you have been forgotten by God or somehow displeased him and he has removed his love for you, but rather it is a reality of those who love God. You are loved by God and suffering will be present in this life and you are not alone in it and it will not separate you from God's love. But rather the reality of those who love God, who are loved by God, is suffering in this life. And for those who love God, who are loved by God, you will overwhelmingly conquer. These trials, these difficulties, this suffering is not an occasion to question God's love. It is occasion to walk in it as you endure in holiness under God's love. The reality of those who love God, who are loved by God, is suffering in this life is a reality. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Trials, afflictions, hardships, suffering are not evidences that God has removed his love from you or that you have been separated, but rather your victory in the midst of those things that would tempt you to doubt God, your victory is evidence of his love for you. By the way, everything in verse 35, Paul himself experienced. Remember 2 Corinthians, he had abundant labor, beaten beyond measure, prison, close to death often. Five times he received 39 lashes from the Jews. Three times he was beaten with rods, stoned. Three times shipwrecked. A night and a day in the deep in perils of water, perils of robbers, perils of his countrymen, perils of heathens, perils of the city, perils of the wilderness, perils of the sea, perils among false brethren, weariness, painfulness, hunger, Thirst, fasting, cold, nakedness, nothing, he says. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. In all of those things, God is giving of himself for the believer's good. We go on to see in 
verses 38 and 39, Paul is convinced of something that not death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, things present now, things to come, nor powers, heights, depths, any other created thing, absolutely nothing can separate you from the love that we find in God expressed in Christ Jesus. God's love is inseparable. When are you tempted to doubt God's love? When are you tempted to, to doubt if you have been separated at separated from it somehow, or, or maybe in your heart, limit the extent that it reaches in your life. God, I know you love me here in this way, but, but these things that are happening in my life right now, why is your love removed from me in relation to these things? His love is close in relation to every area. In fact, it, is, it saturates every area. You cannot be separated from his love in any area. There is no area of your life untouched by God's love, Christian. From the highest peak to the lowest valley of your life, if you are a, a child of God, God's love is present. You may be separated from things in this life. You may be separated from good health. You might be separated from possessions. From people. From friends. From family. You will never. Listen, you... If you are in Christ, you will never for a moment, not for a nanosecond, be separated from the love of God. It is an irrevocable reality. There is an unbreakable connection between you and the love of God, and nothing, nothing, nothing can separate it, can touch it. And though you may lose everything in this life, you can never lose the love of God when you are in the love of God. You actually possess everything you need. This is true for those who are in Christ. Lastly, the last element of God's wondrous love that we'll look at this morning is that God's love is incomprehensible incomprehensible. We've seen, number one, God's love is unprompted. Number two, God's love is indiscriminate. Number three, God's love is inseparable. And lastly, this morning, number four, God's love is incomprehensible. Look at Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14 Paul puts forth a wonderful reality. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, verse 15, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, then verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Here's a prayer that all the saints would understand the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge completely. The greatest treasure that anyone could ever possess is not found in a thing, but it's found in the person of Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian, you abide in Christ and he abides in you. You possess this treasure. And Paul is praying for the Ephesian Christians. He has something on his mind in his prayer. And we're going to go to the punchline here in verse 18. And it's that they may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Paul wants them to know the love of Christ. Then he says, which surpasses knowledge. 
knowledge. It's incomprehensible. You just have to pause for a moment at what feels a little bit like irony. Paul wants them to grasp and understand something that's far beyond comprehension. Paul wants the believer to understand at the deepest degree that which is far beyond the deepest understanding possible. You could sum it up this way. The the depths of knowledge regarding the love of Christ is infinitely deep, but whatever depths is possible for you to attain, for you to go to, get to it, even if you can't get to the bottom, get as deep as possible. As a child, did you ever attempt to dig a hole through the center of earth to get to China? You might say that's impossible. If you can get two feet, get two feet. If you can get six feet, good luck in Arizona. It doesn't work that way here. You're not from here if you got six feet deep. We could never fathom, we could never get to the extremity of the depths of God's love. But Paul is committed to trying. Whatever depths he could get to, he wants you to know the love of God. It surpasses knowledge. We can never exhaust the love of Christ, and yet we must comprehend the love of Christ. The love of Christ is on a different plane than any other love. For those in Christ, Jesus in love chose to lay down his life for us when we lived in a perpetual state of hatred and rebellion against him. He chose to redeem us in his love while we were godless, helpless enemies. He humbled himself to a lower degree than any other person or creature ever could. He did so while the sinners he humbled himself to save seek to perpetually exalt themselves. Mankind is in a perpetual self-grasping toward equality with God, and Jesus didn't regard it something to be grasped, but in contrast, he humbled himself. He doesn't leave or forsake us while we are prone to wander and leave him. Jesus willingly became the man of sorrows on the cross, and we perpetually chafe against and seek to escape from any temporal sorrows that we endure in this life. And we question him as to why we endure hardships and difficulties, and yet we rarely question why he would become a man and endure the wrath of God on behalf of those who would believe He took upon himself the just right punishment of holy wrath for all who would believe for all time. He did this in love. He knew no sin and yet was made sin in love. Uh, No love ever demonstrated by humans in all of history even comes close to the perpetual, unfailing, unending, indiscriminate, unprompted, inseparable love that Jesus shows to those who are his. Where are you being tempted to doubt God's love? I would appeal, doubt it no longer. God's love is truly amazing. God is committed to the good of his people continually. He is trustworthy. He is faithful. His love is truly wondrous. An old hymn captures it well in a verse. says, the love of God is greater far. The verse says, could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. God's love is never weak, it never forsakes, never leaves us. His love is 
is faithful. He is faithful. He doesn't withhold love from us. We are always under the benefits of his love for those who are in Christ. Are you in Christ? This wondrous love is available to you if you would repent, believe in Christ, submit your life to him wholly in faith, turn from living for yourself, yield to Christ, and bask in the measureless, inexhaustible riches of the wondrous love of our God. Next week, we will look closer at the love of God as it pertains to Christ and his incarnation. Can't wait to do so with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time this morning that we have to just look at these wonderful realities about you. And Lord, as we draw nearer to Christmas, Lord, I pray that these realities would just permeate in our hearts and in our minds, guard us from being distracted by lesser things, and help us to be captivated by you. And Lord, I pray that this would endure beyond just a Christmas season where it is right and appropriate to give specific attention and thoughtfulness to the incarnation. But Lord, I pray that your love is something that would truly captivate us always, that we would know the height and breadth and depth of your love that is there for us in Christ Jesus, that we can never be separated for those who are in it. Thank you for grace. Thank you for the cross. Lord, I pray that as we continue about this Lord's Day, Lord, that we would be blessed and that we would be a blessing as we seek to serve and extend love towards others in the same manner that we have received it so abundantly from you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, you're dismissed for a, a moment. Grab some coffee, enjoy some fellowship, and we'll gather back together and about 20 minutes for our Sunday morning service.